So I recognize uh, that on the PFI schedule today and tomorrow, there's not many academics, not many folks from universities, so I appreciate being an exception, and I hope you won't hold it against me. Um, I'm going to uh, try to tell some stories today about what we've been learning in Pennsylvania about uh, kind of conservation-based agriculture and its intersection with integrated pest management. Um, and I welcome, uh, I guess we have like 20 minutes at the end for questions, so I hope to be able to satisfy all your curiosities about the things that I say right or wrong today. Okay, so uh, I'm a big fan of predators. So I'm, oh, I'm an entomologist, right? So I like creepy crawly things. Um, I think they have value on your farm. Um, if your perspective is that the only good insect is a dead insect, you and I are not going to be best friends. Um, but I hope to convince you of the value of them today. And one way to do that is look at pretty pictures. So I have some pretty pictures, and there's one behind me. That's a tiger beetle, which is a type of ground beetle. And if you farm with the way that I'm going to advocate for today, you can get more of those suckers on your farm. And those suckers eat other things. Um, and that, that's a good thing, right? So it's kind of natural pest control is what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I usually start with the take-home messages in case your mind wanders and you think about the snowstorm and the problem you're going to have getting out of here tomorrow. You can think of me trying to get out of the Ames airport tomorrow morning. Not going to work out so well. Um, but the take-home messages are pretty straightforward. So uh, to gain soil health, to earn soil health in your farm, you combine no-till, uh, diverse rotations with cover crops. Um, but a lot of people forget that last piece, which is IPM. That's integrated pest management. If you don't know what that means, I'm going to provide some insight today. Um, we should know that soil is alive. Um, and IPM can help protect it. So by pumping pesticides into your soil, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, predators can help protect your crop from pests, which is going to be a big focus today. And then blind insecticide use can disrupt those predator populations, actually making fields more vulnerable to pests. Okay? So those, again, are the take-home messages, and I'll hit on each of those as we go through, and then I'll remind you at the end. Well, let me provide a little perspective of where I'm coming from. So I'm a professor at Penn State University. Of course, that's in Pennsylvania, right in the geographic heart of the state. Um, and Pennsylvania is a no-till state, so about 70% of our large acreage crops are farmed without tillage, and this is continuous no-till. It's not rotational no-till, it's no-till nearly every year. There are some exceptions with people need to plowing under uh, alfalfa and stuff like that, but for the most part, it's continuous no-till. <coughs> and no-till has many, many advantages, and we can probably have a whole session just on the advantages of no-till, but just to say it quickly, um, since you're going across the field fewer times, you're conserving fuel, you're conserving labor. Since you're not disturbing the soil as much, you're reducing erosion. And that's kind of the biggest one why people in Pennsylvania have adopted it. So it conserves soil and water resources. Uh, these data that comprise this map are from the 2012 USDA Ag Census. 2017 data are out, but I haven't found the map and I'm not making it. But anyway, it provides a little insight on how much no-till is happening in certain parts of the country. And the darker the color blue, the more no-till there is. So you can see Pennsylvania in the mid-Atlantic has a lot of no-till. So that blue color means we're about three-quarters um, no-till. So it's the, it's, the, it's the ratio between um, till, uh, no-till and tilled ground. So in Iowa, you're kind of in the middle of the pack. Um, other parts of the country, of course, are scattered about. The reason that we in Pennsylvania and the other, other mid-Atlantic states um, have adopted no-till so much has to do with the Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay, of course, is the largest estuary. Haley, does this have a pointer? Oh, heck, it does. How about that? Um, it, this is the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay here. It's the largest estuary in the world. Uh, so there's a lot of life there, right? a lot of bird life, a lot of uh, uh, blue crabs are a big um, fishery, a lot of uh, fish come out of the, the bay. But this is what we're trying to avoid with no-till agriculture in central Pennsylvania. So all of central Pennsylvania drains into the Chesapeake Bay, but after a really, really, really big storm event, all our topsoil runs down the Susquehanna River into the Chesapeake Bay. Right? So that's what we're trying to avoid on a daily basis. This image is following Tropical Storm Lee, which occurred in 2007. And uh, dumped inches and inches and inches on Pennsylvania in just a short, short period of time, and it's difficult to fight against that amount of rain. So this chocolate-covered river is what we're trying to avoid on a daily basis with no-till. 
uh, from a pest management perspective, and specifically an invertebrate pest management perspective, there's a strong feeling among growers that when they go from a tilled field to a no-till field, they actually get a more abundant pest population. It's a common uh, belief that I've run, run into across uh, the eastern United States, but it is not the case. When you go from a tilled field to a no-till field, you don't increase the abundance of pests you tend to find on average. What you do, though, is you switch the suite of animals that you encounter, the suite of animals that can be pests. So in no-till fields, you're more likely to find things like black cutworm, true armyworm, and wireworm than you are in a tilled situation. And a tilled, tilled fields have um, a different suite of pests that we could highlight also, but I'm going to ignore those because that's not what I want to talk about. There's a fourth pest on that list that is problematic in no-till, and they are on this hay mower. That hay mower is covered with slugs. You see individual slugs down here um, where they're kind of well spaced, but that just kind of rolls into a nice sheen of Pennsylvania escargot, as we call them. Right? So slugs are just snails without shells, um, and they're very common in no-till agriculture. So if you have no-till, enough of it, and you have enough moisture, like we have in the mid-Atlantic states, you get slugs. Right? This gentleman didn't know why he ha his hay field wasn't yielding well, but he happened to be harvesting at night early in the spring of 2012, which is a very rainy year in Pennsylvania. Um, and then he got this insight. So slugs are nocturnal. If you want to know what they're doing, then you need to go outdoors at night. So slugs um, are a pain in the neck, and they're difficult to control, in part because they eat anything they want. If you are a backyard gardener, you know that they'll feed on your peas, they'll feed on your lettuce, they'll feed on your spinach all early in the spring. But if you're a field crop grower, you're growing canola, um, it's like candy to them. They really love brassicas. They love soybeans, and they're particularly hard on it because of the vulnerability um, of the early seedlings. Uh, they'll eat alfalfa and small grains happily, um, and they'll eat a lot of corn. Um, but a, a key detail that I will turn to is that they don't like corn. They actually overeat corn. So this is what slug damage on corn looks like. It's this kind of shredding damage. But corn is nutritionally unbalanced for slugs. It doesn't have enough protein. So for them to get as much protein as they want, they actually cause more damage than they would on a crop than on a crop that has more protein. So they're overeating on corn. It'd be like you eating Cheetos. And that's all you're going to eat this week. You'd have to eat a load of Cheetos to get enough protein so your stomach stop yelling at you, right? I don't know if you care for Cheetos or not, but come up with a different analogy some other day. A little more uh, evidence of the damage that slugs can cause. This is a, uh, a slug feeding on a soybean plant in the cotyledon stage, and it's already killed this plant because it knocked the cotyledons off. Of course, that plant's not going to grow anymore. You can see that kind of pitting damage, and it kind of slowly eats away the cotyledons. That plant is nearly dead. It's going to be severed here shortly if that feeding continues. And this is a field from Lancaster County, which is in southeastern Pennsylvania, that's been in long-term no-till. And this field has been planted uh, this was from 2017. This field's been planted three times already, and that's the soybean stand that we have. So I'm sure you wouldn't be happy if that was your field, and this farmer wasn't happy, which is why he invited me to town. <laughs> OK. But, all right, so let's, let's now bring a couple of these threads together. So we have slugs, um, but we're doing this in no-till. So the reason that slugs are problematic in no-till is because of that stable habitat. It's not being disturbed regularly. The best way to control slugs is with tillage. If you have slugs and you're tilling every year, you have a problem that I cannot solve. I don't know who can solve that problem. But when I look at no-till fields, um, what, I don't, what I see is not slug habitat. I see habitat for natural enemies. No-till is the basis for conservation. That's why most of Pennsylvania has gone to it. But the conservation benefits beyond erosion control are often overlooked. Again, from an entomological perspective, this is habitat for good things out there. There might be slugs in there, but if the good things are outnumbering the slugs, the slugs aren't going to cause a problem. That stability provided by this habitat is wonderful habitat for natural enemies. And then if you put cover crops on top of that, you're expanding the, the habitat base. The, the range of things that can be happy there kind of increases. You can have a more diverse community. And then you can foster a food web that is helping with your pest control. So I've already said this, you know this, that the soil is alive. That's why scientists measure its respiration. We can't measure respiration unless it was actually breathing. A lot of what's there are microbes. But I'm going to ignore the microbes, because so many people kind of talk about them these days. I'm going to focus on the things that have exoskeletons. Those are all the arthropods. 
So all the things in this picture are living in the top part of the soil. They're all arthropods, and they have various functions. Arthropods are the larger group that contain insects and crustaceans. Crustaceans are just the insects of the sea. That's where your lobsters and shrimp and all that yummy stuff is. Over on the uh, terrestrial side, that's where the insects occur. Right? You guys learned all this in high school. I'm just reminding you. And this is what a typical food web looks like. This is an organic-based food web. You have organic residue goes in. You have this um, residue colonized by fungi, bacteria, and various things. And then the arthropods start feeding on that stuff. And then larger arthropods start feeding on that stuff. Worms and slugs and all kinds of creepy crawlies fit into this food web. But the point is, is you can't have this food web in a real healthy state unless you have a good source of organic matter. That's your crop residue. That's your cover crop uh, residue. And that's, that's facilitated by no-till. OK, so you might ask the question, John, why do I care about soil arthropods? Well, soil arthropods do a number of things. I'm just going to list them here for you. I'll go through them quickly. They shred organic uh, material, making them more available to bacterial and fungi that can help break them down. They stimulate that microbial activity by feeding, and every insect and other arthropod out there expel stuff out the back end. Uh, if, you, if you're writing stuff down, the word frass is a wonderful word for scrabble, F-R-A-S-S. -S. It's the word for insect poo, right? So if your spouse or friend down the street is bothering you, you can call them a frass head, and they won't know what you're talking about. That's a good word. So this is, uh, stimulates microbial activity feeding in through their frass, again, F-R-A-S-S. -S. They are mineralizing plant nutrients as they feed and, and frass, uh, produce frass. They enhance soil aggregation. They burrow through the soil. Um, aerating the same way earthworms do. These guys just get less credit for it. They stimulate a succession of species, and then they can help control pests. That's the one we're going to focus on most today. So again, there's a large movement in the country that's been going on for a while about building soil health. There's a lot of hand-waving around what soil health is, but it's fairly well understood that if you want to build soil health, you start with no-till, you have a diverse crop rotation that includes cover crops. The goal of that, of those three tactics together, is to build soil life. You want more microbes, you got more worms, and more arthropods. Right? So we're building soil life. But the way to protect that is to use integrated pest management. Okay? So integrated pest management values the life in your soil. It encourages you to scout to know if you have any insect pests in your field, to know if you have a problem from a pest that's infesting your field, and then use those insecticides as a last resort. Not as a first option, but as a last resort. Right? So protect arthropods, including those natural enemies that can help with your pest control. So I've been using this term integrated pest management for a bit now, and now I'm going to define it in case you haven't encountered it before. But it's just using a combination of biological, cultural, and chemical tactics to control your pests. It was introduced in 1959 by a bunch of entomologists at the University of California, Riverside, with the main goal of making pest control economical and natural enemy based. So predators are the focus of this effort. And the goal is to ensure profitability. So we only want to expend any money on insecticides when it makes economic sense. Right? So if we don't know we're going to get something in return for insecticide use, we're not going to do it. Right? Doing this has a kind of a swath of benefits. The first one is avoiding resistance. So we're avoiding developing insect pest populations in our field that are resistant to the insecticides that we might want to use. That includes BT crops. Right? We're avoiding pollution by using less pesticides that don't get into the neighboring waterway and cause all kinds of trouble. And we avoid reducing natural enemy populations because those natural enemies, which I also uh, interchange with the term predators, are benefiting our fields by limiting pest populations. Unfortunately, modern agriculture has gone the exact opposite direction. Right, so modern corn production, modern cotton production, modern soybean production is going to a more intensive use of pesticides. What we want is what, what seems to be being sold is a more uniform package that provides kind of a simplicity um, that more growers seem to like. On top of that, we have companies that are incentivizing, are, are, are sorry, incentived, incentivized to sell you things you might not need. To do that, they often try to scare you. Right? You've probably run across advertisements in the trade journals. Right? So this one makes the roots of that plant into a fort. Like if you put this Cruiser Max Vibrance 
on your roots, or you buy it with it on the roots, you're, it's going to be like a fortress. And who's going to go through that fortress? No insect pests, I know, right? If you're in the United Kingdom, you can have these great uh, sentinel um, soldiers hanging out by your field. I'm not sure what they're going to stop. If you've ever been to Buckingham Palace, they don't do a whole lot, but just kind of walk around. But apparently, this is an advertisement to convince you that you should have stuff on your seed to stop pests. This is a great one, right? So that is a venomous snake. You can see by the triangular-shaped head, right? It's after insects most. Venomous snakes don't attack insects. But that snake is decorated as a plant. But plants have their own defenses. They don't need to be turned into this venomous snake, right? Plants have an amazing array of defenses if we just let the plant do its own thing. And this is my favorite one. So if you use poncho on your corn, you're going to stop these creepy aphids. But how many of you in the room know that aphids have teeth? Look at these craggly teeth. <laughs> right, aphids don't have craggly teeth. Aphids don't have teeth. This is their mouth part. They jam that into the plant and they suck out the juices. They don't have teeth. So this is a clear effort by a company to make it more scary. Right? And you can look at any tr trade journal newspaper that sells this stuff. And you'll see they're trying to make you a little bit more concerned about the nasties that are in your field. I see insecticides as valuable tools, but they should not be the first line of defense. So and I, when I talk about insecticides, I'm talking about any type of insecticide, whether it's sprayed on leaves, put in the soil, or put on seeds, so those seed coatings. right? Historically, historically, they are overused. We can go into the history of this some other time, but it could be out, out of World War II became this, this ability to control anything we want. The technologies that went into World War II were amazing. And out of that came the sentiment that insects needed to be controlled. And now we have the technology to do it, so let's do it. And historically, insecticides are overused. I would far prefer that they were deployed via integrated pest management so you have an economic reason to do it, a justified economic reason to do it. If we overuse insecticides, we have these unintended consequences. Right? We can decrease the number of good insects. That makes your pest problems worse. And we also have environmental concerns. Whether or not you're aware of it, the insecticides that are coated on seeds, those neonicotinoid insecticides, are in rivers and streams in Iowa right now. They're leaching out of your crop fields into those areas, and they're simplifying the aquatic insect communities there. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's probably a bad thing. And the bird populations are telling us it's a bad thing. It seems that bird populations around the world are going down as these ecosystems are exposed to these types of insecticides. We don't need to get into the morals of all that. That's getting a little bit of a quagmire. But let's simply say that there are environmental concerns about overusing insecticides. And again, to emphasize, all insecticides do the same thing. Just because it's coated on a seed, it may seem innocuous, but it's doing the exact same thing. It's limiting predator populations, which you probably don't want it to do. This is a complicated figure, but it's from a colleague at Cornell University named Kyle Wickings, and he's a turf entomologist. You heard that right. There are entomologists that study turf. I don't understand it, but they're out there. This figure shows very, various axes. Each axis is a good function that we want to occur in soils, whether it's decomposer density. So these are big decomposers, little decomposers, predators, uh, big predators, little predators, and so on. So what we want is uh, our soil function to be maximized along each of these axes. So you'll see the largest pentagon, or the largest polygon, is the one that has no insecticides in it. And this turf system, as more insecticide is added, going from green to blue to yellow to red, that polygon gets smaller. So our soil function goes down as we increase insecticide use in this turf system. We have the same experiment going on in corn and soybeans at Penn State and Cornell right now, and we hope to have those results in another year. Okay, that will be the final, this is the final year of the project. So we hope to make a similar figure to see if the same thing is going on in field crop production, but I have no reason to believe it's not. All right? So there should be a lot of similarities between turf production and anything else, because we're putting insecticides in where we don't need them. Okay, let's take a quick diversion. Uh, in Pennsylvania, it's hard not to find people that are enthusiastic for hunting. I don't know what the hunting culture is in Iowa. I can say clearly that we have more woods in Pennsylvania than you have in Iowa, so there might be more opportunity to hunt in the woods of Pennsylvania. Regardless, if you're a hunter, you want to go out into the woods um, during deer season, and you want to see that, right? Perhaps you would prefer to see a buck, but at the very least, you'd like to see something. <laughs> have an opportunity to harvest some meat for the winter, right? 
What I see in central Pennsylvania, though, is that. Right, when I go hunting, which I don't do, when I go hiking, right, I, I drag my two sons to go hiking with me, and they, they complain and complain and complain, Dad, why do we have to do this? I said, well, we're getting out of the house. And we look through the understory, what you see is nothing. Right? You don't see any deer, but you sure see evidence that deer have been around. What's the evidence that deer have been around? <laughs> I, I am thrilled that you learned that word, sir, but I, I, I don't think that's the right answer. <laughs> feces might be the right answer. So you might be able to see their feces around the ground, but the main evidence that there are, not, there are deer here is that there's nothing regrowing. There's nothing in the understory. So this forest isn't regenerating because there are too many deer around. That's clearly evident here. If you, uh, so from this we know that deer strongly influence forest regrowth. We know this because there are scientists around the world that put up deer exclusion fences. Here's one of those fences from Pennsylvania. Right? It's a big, tall uh, wire fence. Deer cannot access this side of the fence. They can access this side of the fence. So that fence is kind of acting like a predator. Right? Because on this side of the fence, it's excluding deer, which a predator would do. On this side of the fence, it's not. So we can see the influence of predators if we squint here, right? So if we don't have as many deer around, you actually get forest regrowth. So from this, we know that we can influence how well a forest regrows just by excluding things that like to feed on plants. There's been a kind of very interesting ongoing natural experiment that's been occurring in northern Wisconsin for about the last 15 years. The data I'm going to show you from a 2013 paper, and this is a map of northern Wisconsin. I believe those are the Apostle Islands, which is a national park, very beautiful. And they've introduced wolves into that part of Wisconsin. And I'm not going to get into whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. It's an idea. This map shows the various parts of the, of the northern um, section of Wisconsin and the, uh, the wolf residence time. Right? So the darker the color black, there are more wolves in those parts of the state for a longer period of time. Right? So the really dark color black, say like here, they've had wolves in that part of the world for 10 years. And the white parts of the map, there haven't been wolves established there yet. They haven't colonized that part of the state. And if we looked at the regrowth of the forest in these parts of the state, we can see that where wolves have not colonized, and I apologize for the black and white picture, that's what I was able to pull from their publication, it's kind of, uh, it's not very diverse and regrowth isn't happening very quickly in the understory. Right? So wolves aren't around. Deer can feed with impunity. That suppresses the growth, the regrowth of the forest. In parts of the distribution where there are a lot of wolves, the deer are less comfortable. They don't feed as much. They probably only feed in brief bouts, and they move around a whole lot more. And the forest is coming back. I trust you can see that there's more in the understory there, even though it's a black and white photo, particularly you folks in the back. Don't take my word for it. There's more stuff in the understory here. That's in part because of the presence of the wolves. So the deer are uncomfortable. The deer are afraid, right? Who the heck wants to get eaten by a wolf, right? So you're going to eat maybe just quietly at night, maybe just come out from your bedding, take a couple bites and go down. So you have a less of an influence on the forest. What we'd like to be able to do is take advantage of this in agriculture. So we know from this example and many others that predators can influence plant growth. Right? Can we take advantage of this in agriculture? These data are from data we've collected in Pennsylvania over the last 10 years, showing the amount of plant feeding damage to corn plants on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is predator populations. These are things that eat those things causing that damage. This figure simply shows that if we get greater populations of predators, the amount of feeding to those plants goes down. The exact same thing that the wolves are having, the exact same effect that the wolves are having on those deer. Okay? So we can take advantage of it in agriculture. So how do we get there? We get there by fostering populations of things like that. So that big green beetle I showed you earlier is a tiger beetle, it's a type of ground beetle. This is another type of ground beetle. Right? That's the adult, that's the larva. Both stages of this insect, adult and larva, are predators. The, the little worm-like thing burrows through the soil, anything gets its mandibles on, it will eat. And the same thing for the adult, though it runs around on the soil surface. I assure you, if there was a, a school or a pod or a, I don't even know what they're called, like a, what's the collective noun for beetles? 
I don't know. We, there should be one. But uh, let's call it a pod. If there was a pod of these rolling down Main Street in Ames, like, people would be calling the cops if they're the size of a dog. But they're the, about the size of a quarter. And you just, they're easily overlooked. But to an insect, they're problematic. But to a slug, they're problematic. So these guys happily eat any of the things that are typical pests in no-till situations. Just to provide a little bit of evidence of what they can do, there's a ground beetle. Who wins here? Every time there's a wrestling match between that ground beetle and the caterpillar, who wins? The beetle every time. Thank you for not saying crap. Every time. So if you have, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand per acre of these beetles, you don't need insecticides as much. You probably don't need insecticides maybe once every other year or something like that. So now, so insects have exoskeletons. This caterpillar has an exoskeleton. Now his guts, this is why I became an entomologist. His guts are outside. I know this might be gruesome, but it's pretty great. Now his guts are outside, his exoskeleton, and now the beetle's eating his guts, right? So that caterpillar is dead. If you don't like corn earworm, you should be cheering for that beetle time and time again. Good for the... <laughs> you guys are the best. Right? So that's a... You, I mean, that happens every day in your crop fields. If we can make it happen more, then we don't need insecticides as much. All right, let's take a quick diversion and talk about the neonicotinoid insecticides. Those are the things that are coated on your seeds. That's poncho, that's cruiser, that's gaucho. Okay? These things are coated on seeds. When you put that seed into the soil, capillary action pulls that insecticide out into the soil, and then when the plant starts to grow, it's taken up by the root system. And it runs systemically through the plant. So anything that feeds upon that plant is going to get a dose of that insecticide. The only details are whether that animal gets enough of the insecticide to matter and whether that animal is sensitive to that insecticide. Okay? So if a deer bites that, or a groundhog bites that, or a beetle bites that, it gets a dose of the insecticide. It's just a question of whether it's sensitive and it gets enough of the insecticide. When these were first introduced back in the early 2000s, it appeared to be a very targeted application. Um, and it certainly can protect yield. But to protect yield, you need to have the pests present. This is what a lot of people overlook. The pests that are being targeted aren't very common. So it has this systemic activity. It has this nice low dose. But it's a low dose of one of the most toxic insecticides that's ever been introduced, right? It has low mammalian toxicity. In my hands at Penn State, we've done experiment after experiment after experiment testing yield response when we have an untreated seed, a treated seed with a low rate, low rate and a treated seed with a high rate, just as we show here. This is on soybeans. I could show you the exact same picture with corn. We never see a yield advantage. And it's not because the insecticide doesn't kill insects. It's because the pests are rare. Nevertheless, adoption of these insecticides has been remarkable. This is the amount of neonicotinoids used in various crop over time. They were introduced, again, in the early uh, 2000s, um, particularly on corn and soybeans. Corn is in red here. Soybeans is yellow. What is driving this use? Partially fear, partially the bigger picture would be marketing. Marketing is driving this stuff. But people were growing corn back in the mid-2000s without this stuff, and people forget that. Now, it's, it, you, I've encountered many, many growers that tell me, I can't farm without poncho. My, in my heart, my response is bullshit, right? But I can't say that out loud. I shouldn't say that here. Now it's on tape. Say bullfrass. Gosh darn it, sir. You should be giving this talk. Thank you. But anyway, this adoption rate is the steepest adoption rate of any insecticide ever been used, right? And it's blanketing our country. Um, remarkably, between 2011 and 2014, the amount of insecticides being deployed as seed treatments doubled. This is the exact same time where people were raising concerns about the connection between these insecticides and bee populations. The only measurable response we have of big companies selling this stuff during this whole bee crisis was to increase the amount they're selling, not decrease. It's actually doubled amazing. If you haven't seen these maps, they're alarming. This is the amount used over the United States. This is clothianidin, the, amount, the uh, active ingredient in poncho. That's the amount that was used in 2003, so none. That's 2011, and that's 2014. Look at where Iowa is. 
you are in a sea of these insecticides. This is measured in pounds per acre. Pounds per acre is a scary unit when we're putting milligram amounts on seeds. Right? We're crossing uh, metric and, um, and uh, standard units there, but you know what I'm talking about. OK, so let's get some, into some of the gory details. If you're putting this and stuff on your seed, or you're buying this stuff um, on your corn or soybean seed, this is what you can control. Aphids, black cutworm, corn, corn, flea beetle, seed corn maggot, white grub, and wireworm, and a very similar list for soybeans. The ones that are underlined are where the insecticide is particularly good. The one in parentheses there, black cutworm, is where the insecticide is particularly bad. Like, if you're only controlling your black cutworm with your seed applied insecticide, you're probably failing if black cutworm shows up. But notice that these are secondary pests. Just by definition, they're not our primary concern. So these things show up occasionally, but they're certainly not showing up every year. Notice what's not on that list. Slugs. What phylum are slugs in? Don't say crustacean. They don't have an exoskeleton. Someone knows this. Mollusk. Good work. Gold star for you. Free conference registration next year. <laughs> right, they're a mollusk. Right? So they're more closely related to clams than they are to insects. Right? So if you want to control a mollusk, you have a couple options. You could use your boot or a brick. More correctly, you could use a molluscicide. Right? And that's different than an insecticide. So let's ask this question. What do insecticides do in the soil to soil arthropod populations? In our hands, in Pennsylvania, we're seeing this pattern. The vertical axis here, we have the number of slugs per trap. The horizontal axis is your corn growing season. The red line shows fields where we're tracking slug populations where we've planted a corn seed that's treated with a neonicotinoid insecticide. The blue line is a naked seed. On average, over the course of this corn growing season, we have more slugs where we use the insecticide than when we're not. Right? It shows that we're actually farming our own problem by using that insecticide when slugs are our main concern. So let me provide some gory details on an experiment we did a couple years ago. This was a simple experiment with 12 plots, six of each type. We either had an untreated seed, so that was a naked seed with no fungicides on it, no insecticides, and we compared that to a thymethoxum, a cruiser max treated seed. So this is thymethoxum as the active ingredient, and as an insecticide and two fungicides. The fungicides are not part of this story. You just have to take my word for that. Um, we can talk about that after if you like. So our sample size is six here, so we have six of each type. They're quarter acre plots, which are much bigger than most entomologists use, and they were planted on 30 inch rows, which isn't the norm, but we needed to get down the row between the soybean seeds, uh, seedlings to, to measure things. And I'm going to walk you through four figures to show you our results. The vertical axis on this figure we have yield. The horizontal axis we have number of soybean plants per acre. This relationship makes perfect sense. So as the number of soybean plants per acre goes up, our yield goes up. But notice the color of the dots. The black dots are the, are the plots where we had insecticides. So on average, we have fewer plants per acre and lower yield where we're paying for our pest management tactic that's coated on the seed. <clears throat> Let's relate this now to slugs. So the horizontal axis is the number of slugs per trap. Uh, to trap slugs, we just use um, uh, white shingles. So actually, shingles that might go on your roof. We cut them up into little chunks, and we throw them into the field, and we go and count the number of slugs that are underneath them. So as we get more slugs under these shingle traps, the number of soybean plants per acre comes down. And then, of course, our yield will come down. But the number, uh, the color of the dots again matters. So where we have insecticides coated on the seeds, we actually have more slugs and fewer soybean plants per acre. Now let's connect these ideas to predators. This uh, uh, vertical axis here is predation. And the horizontal axis is number of slug predators. So slug predators are things like those beetles I've been showing you. Predation is how we measure uh, the activity of those predators. So what we do is we take a, a caterpillar, and we put a pin through the back end of that caterpillar, and we put that pin into the ground. So that caterpillar is a sitting duck. We call it a sentinel prey item. And then we, we, um, we account for how many are taken away by predators as our measure of predation. So the higher the number, the better. If, if this was a, a, a 1.0, that would be 100% of those caterpillars are removed by these, um, these predators. So again, that's the act of predation. In a perfect world, we would do this with slugs. right? But slugs don't have exoskeletons. So what happens when you put a pin through a slug and put that pin into the ground? 
right? You don't know, but I do. They, they pull themselves off the pin, and we get these two-tailed slugs. They're very rare, but they occur in central Pennsylvania. You can't keep them there because they don't have an exoskeleton. That was a, that was a joke. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you, this guy gets free, free stuff next year, too. Anyway, so this is predation. But it's on these caterpillars, so it's imperfect. But I'll show you how it works out in a second here. So the bigger the number, the better, and the number of slug uh, slugs per the number of slug predators per trap, the better. So as the number of slug predators per trap goes up, our predation goes up, and on average, where we have the insecticides, we have fewer slug predators and less predation. And then let's connect this to slugs. Okay, so we weren't using slugs for our predation measure, but this figure shows us that the proxy we're using for slugs is okay. So this is predation. Again, as predation goes up, the number of slugs on those single traps goes down, and they're just right next to each other. So it shows us that the, uh, this proxy we're using, this caterpillar, is actually pretty good for um, assessing slug populations. So as predation goes up, the number of slugs comes down. But on average, where we have the insecticides, the black dots, we have less predation and more slugs per trap. So in this experiment, we're finding that the insecticides are disrupting biocontrol. But it's not a direct exposure to the insecticide that you might expect. If you were broadcasting that insecticide across the field with a sprayer, you might expect a direct exposure. So the insecticide is actually hitting the beetles. And here, the insecticide is running through the slugs. This is what it looks like. Here's a ground beetle, which is a, this one is a slug specialist. That guy just ate a slug that was feeding on a soybean plant grown from an untreated seed. So there's no insecticide here. For whatever reason, that animal falls on its back every once in a while, and it gets up. It's real quick-like, right? That's a quick beetle. This one just ate a slug that was feeding on a soybean plant grown from an insecticide-coated seed. It's sad. Right, so this guy is showing sheer, uh, clear signs of insecticide poisoning. And if we try to turn this thing over, it can't do it. Right, so it's lethargic. It has insecticide in its body. And if that animal is in the field being poisoned, it's going to get eaten by a bird or a mouse in a no-till field before anything else. And it's not providing any predation benefits. Right? <coughs> so that said, these guys will recover if we give them a chance. Here's one where the beetle um, attacked that slug, but, and the slug survived, but the beetle is messed up. Right, so this seems to have just gotten a mouthful of slug, and that's all it needed, and the slug still survived. This made us think that the, the insecticide is just in the, uh, in the mucus, the outer coating of the slug. Um, but we have tried to measure that, and it's not, we can't find it. So my grad student, Maggie, she um, collected a gram of, sl of slug slime and sent it off for analysis. We found a very small amount of insecticide, not enough to make us think it's really doing a whole lot, but anyway. OK, so this, little, this work we've done, which has been, um, it's been in the press a little bit, we got a little um, attention for it, um, has been dismissed as a regional problem. But in my mind, it's exemplary of what will happen if you use too many insecticides. You'll just make your pest populations worse because your predator populations are going to go down. And we know that fields with fewer predators are more vulnerable to pest invasion. In 2017, I was thrilled to see a very similar example from Australia. Believe it or not, there are slugs in Australia. I don't know how they're faring with the wildfires they have going on, which is super sad. But these guys saw a similar story, but a slightly different um, outcome um, in terms of the insecticides being used. So here on the vertical axis, in this pixelated picture, we have slug abundance over a number of years where we have three treatments. The, the purple line is where they're broadcasting chlorpyrifos, or Lorsban, and they're getting more slugs. So they have more slugs where they're using Lorsban. So in this example, this is probably a direct exposure to the insecticide. So they're spraying the insecticide, the predators are dying, and then the slug populations are free to grow. But it's a very similar story from Australia, so I was thrilled to see kind of this corroboration in the literature. You can also ask the question, what else do these seed treatments do in your fields? Well, this is my student, uh, Kirsten Pearson. She's been doing a decomposition experiment for the past three years. So she takes um, straw, puts them in these various bags, puts them out in the field, and brings them back in, and just measures their weight loss. And then the arthropods that are colonizing these bags. It's called decomposition. She puts them in these uh, funnels in our lab, and then she can collect all the arthropods in little cups she puts on the base here. She can collect all the arthropods and measure how, much, uh, how many arthropods there and how quickly that residue went away, just called a decomposition experiment. And what she's found 
is that if you're just focusing on a year or two, there's not much of a difference. So this is the amount of litter remaining. So we want um, here a lower number is better, right? And so in the, and she's done a number of batches of this. So in this particular batch, there wasn't much difference. If you had the seed treatment there, it didn't really slow things down. So we're expecting that the seed treatment would kill the arthropods. That would slow decomposition. In later batches, we're starting to see it because the, the fields have been in the insecticide treatment longer. So at the end, we actually have a difference here where, where we have the insecticide residue is going away slow, more slowly. So residue is persisting in fields longer. And then the last year, after three years of being in this experiment, we found the biggest difference. So this is the percent litter remaining um, going from uh, July of 2018 to the end of July 2018. Oh, sorry, the end of October 2018, and this is the amount of litter remaining where you're using the insecticide. So significantly more residue where the insecticide is being used, and we think that's because we're limiting our springtail populations. Springtail is an arthropod also known as a columbolin, right? And we also think this might be contributing to slug populations. So if you have residue in fields, slugs love hiding under that residue. What's happening with this insecticide, though, is they are, that residue is staying around longer providing more habitat for slugs. So it's a one-two punch. The seed treatment is taking out the predators. It's also keeping residue around longer, which makes slugs happier. So it's a weird feedback loop. Okay. So when I tell growers in Pennsylvania, and I have an extension appointment, I give a lot of talks to growers, I tell them to manage for the pests that they have. To know what you have, you have to walk your fields. You have to be in tune with the pest populations you have. So if slugs are your biggest uh, concern, farm with predators in mind, Get the insecticides out of the field, and that will help the predator populations grow, right? And that will decrease the problems you're having with slugs. If wireworms are your main concern, maybe that seed treatment has value. But most no-till fields that I run into, slugs are the primary concern. I'll provide a couple more examples, then I'll take some questions. So we've had a project going on for 10 years at Penn State called the Diversified Dairy Cropping Systems Project. In this project, we are comparing two types of rotations. One's a very simple rotation that we can find on many conventional farms. It's a simple corn-soybean rotation with no cover crops uh, between the corn and the soy, or the soy and the corn. And we're comparing that to six-year rotations that are far more diverse. They have, some of them have, uh, one of them has uh, alfalfa, the other one has small grains. This is a six-year diverse rotation. From an insect management perspective, we're doing two quite different things here. In this two-year rotation, we're using BT corn, uh, seed treatment on the corn and the soy, and we're putting a broadcast of pyrethroid out shortly after planting, which is very common among our growers. And we're comparing that to this six-year rotation where we're using IPM. In that IPM rotation, we are not using seed treatments, we're not using BT corn, we're using a non-BT variety, and we're only using, using insecticides if our scouting reveals that the pest population is economically significant. Not surprisingly, the pest populations have been worse where we're using all the insecticides. Like, so we're farming our own challenges. And the reason that the more diverse rotation isn't getting as many pests has to do with the predators. So this is the number of predators over the first six years of this experiment, one through six. And on the right is the low input system. That's the system where we are, um, have the longer rotation and no uh, fewer insecticides going in compared to the high input rotation, where it's just corn and soybeans, no cover crops, and we're putting insecticides in every year. At the fourth year, we start to see a difference in the predator population. So we have significantly more predators in the low input, uh, high diversity rotation, and that continues to go upward. Now we have data for 10 years, and the difference is even greater. And that's the figure I showed you earlier. So this is the amount of slug damage to corn plants on the vertical axis, comparing them to the early season predators that can take them out. So again, if you can grow that predator populations, slugs go down. And in my mind, slugs are the hardest thing to control from an invertebrate perspective in no-till. So if you can control your slugs, everything else is simple. All right, I'll just stop um, after this one example. All right, I, by that clock out there, I have like four minutes. And I think I'm right on time. This is an example from a gentleman named Lucas Criswell, who's a farmer in eastern Pennsylvania, east central Pennsylvania. He's a uh, member of what we call the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance. He's a very progressive, open-minded farmer. The Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance aspires to be something like PFI, but we are in just the early stages of that in Pennsylvania. Anyway, he's one of the board of uh, director uh, members. 
And this is the barley field that I visited in 2009 when I first started my job. One of the first farm visits I made was to Lucas's farm, and I, he was telling me about his slug problems. And I was unprepared because you don't learn anything about slugs in entomological grad school. Over at Iowa State, you have a nice entomology department. Those people don't know anything about slugs because they're not relevant here. So I was taken by surprise. Um, but Lucas made this one observation. And I did a poor job here. But he said that, that clean field, that clean field has no weeds in it. Right? If, we want, if that slug wants to eat something green, its only choice is to eat what I've planted, to eat that barley. And he said, can we give them something else to eat? That was his only idea that day. It's, no, I didn't have any idea, so that's not disparaging. That's the only idea we had that day. And so we said, let's, let's see if it can work. So that inspired me to write a little grant. I got a little bit of money. We split that money between Lucas and me. We did the experiment at his farm and our farm in central Pennsylvania. This is our research farm. And we did a very simple thing. We planted cereal rye between the rows. So here we have. Soybeans, cereal rye, soybeans, cereal rye, and so on. And here's a plot that just has soybeans with nothing between the rows, and similar over here. And we did this experiment in corn and in soybeans, again, at two locations. Our expectation was having something between the row would dilute the amount of damage the slugs do. And just to emphasize, we did this in the spring. So we established both crops in the spring. We put the cereal rye seed in our fertilizer box of our little planter. Okay. And we saw some interesting results. So here in the vertical axis, we have the amount of slug damage, where we had no rye between the row, and where we had rye between the row. So just by having something else in the field, we decreased by about half the amount of damage that slugs were doing to the cash crop, whether it was corn or soybean. But the ground beetles, where we had the more diversified plots, go hog wild. This is the number of ground beetles where we had no rye between the row and where we had rye between the row. So there's about three times as many when you have a more diversified planting. This experiment has a limitation, though, because no farmer in their right mind is going to establish a cover crop in the spring at the same time they're establishing their cash crop. So Lucas did it in the fall, right? So he established a cereal rye in the fall. When he established it the previous fall to this picture, he left 30-inch gaps. So now he can come back with his corn planter and target those 30-inch gaps, right? And it works so well, his slug populations have really gone away, that then he started planting like that. So that's him planting corn. Called it, we call it, everyone calls it planting green. So planting green is far more popular in Pennsylvania these days, in part because of his work showing that it decreases slug populations. That worked so well, then he went all in. He bought these Dawn rollers. Right, so this is these, maybe you've seen these articulated rollers on the front of row units. Um, it costs a, uh, a little bit of money to set them up that way, but th if this corn planter was running, it'd be coming right at us. And when it plants, it looks like that when he's done. Okay, so here's the unrolled rye, here's the rolled rye, and that provides three clear benefits. One is it provides a nice alternative food source for slugs. Slugs will feed on this cereal rye that's dying. One more detail, one to seven days after he rolls, he comes back with glyphosate, and then that cover crop slowly, uh, slowly dies. So that slowly dying cover crop is providing an alternative food source for slugs. It's providing great habitat for the natural enemies I've tried to convince you are important. And it's suppressing weeds. You need less herbicides in a system like this, assuming that the cover crop dies. That's what it looks like a little bit more uh, close up. We have farmers that will plant green without the rollers, but these are the, the benefits that rolling provides. Uh, Lucas is a curious guy, so he's done a bunch of side-by-side -side work and found that an inexpensive, untreated, untraded seed in this system yields just as much as a traded, treated seed. Right? So you actually have reduced input cost, but he's not used because he's not using as many pesticides. He's saving about $9,000 a year on his pesticides. He doesn't get a Christmas card anymore from his pesticide dealer. <laughs> is that problematic? I don't know. Right? And this is the picture from August in that same system. In August, that residue persists, so it's still providing habitat. It's still providing some cover on that soil so that there's less soil loss, or sorry, water loss. It's my second to last slide. So just some final thoughts. Right? So if you're interested in soil health, no-till, diverse rotations with cover crops is the way to start. Right? That is building soil health with diversity, organic matter, input, that rotation that's in that diverse rotation is helping disrupt pest populations. That's only a good thing. So we're reducing disturbance. We're using no-till. That perennial crop in the rotation really helped. But you have to reduce the insecticide and fungicide use as much as possible. I didn't say much about fungicides today. You can ask about that in your questions uh, at the end here. But the key, to some of the, the key to this, in my mind, is the IPM. 
If you're going to plant green or do something progressive like this and not use IPM, then you're not giving your system as much of a chance to succeed. I know farmers in Pennsylvania have done this very thing but used their typical preventative insecticide program, and they've had a mess. We call it a frath show. <laughs> right? IPM is the key here. You just can't pump insecticides in the system the same way. You have to use them as necessary. Okay, so there are the take-home messages I already told you. Soil health matters. If we want to build it, we need no-till, diverse rotations with cover crops. But IPM is a key piece you cannot overlook. Healthy soil is alive. High PM can help protect it. Predators can help protect crops from pests if you let them, but you have to farm with those predators in mind. And blind insecticide use, just using whatever comes off the shelf or whatever your seed dealer gives you, can disrupt predator populations. It actually makes your field more vulnerable to pests. Okay. I'll be happy to take any questions you have. And we have like 20 minutes. So yes, yes ma'am. No, oh, behind you. Sorry, she was, she was first. I apologize. So, so let's, let's stop and not answer that question, and we'll go on to somebody else. The, so, yes, the, so um, the, the kind lady asked, what is the predator for Japanese beetles? Um, the best predator for Japanese beetles that I know of are spiders. Um, so, but spiders are a different cat, right? Um, there are also these wasps that attack Japanese beetles, and you can foster them by planting flowers around. Um, and, the, and the beetles, uh, sorry, and the, and the wasps will visit the flowers and then they'll lay their eggs in the Japanese beetles when they're underground, which is a, is a hard thing to do. Um, but I've seen uh, some research papers that show nice results with that. But on a practical level, the best thing you can do for Japanese beetle control is have your neighbor put out those traps. Really, don't do it yourself. Have your neighbor do it. Because they, the beetles come to where those traps are. So if you have your neighbors on either side do it, that's the best way. But Japanese beetles are hard. Um, you know, in, some of the pests uh, that are the hardest to control are these exotic species, and we just don't have the natural enemy communities that are, that are there in place to take care of them. But, but fostering spider populations by getting uh, some architecture, some vertical architecture in your fields is a way to go. The more spiders you have, uh, the better. So if, um, if you, the question was, what do, you, what do I mean by vertical uh, architecture? Just vertical structure. So if you have um, just, uh, say, uh, I don't know, in Pennsylvania, our, like, our processing tomato fields are all like, flat on the ground. Like, they don't, there's no height to them. What I would do is I would, go, I would put some, a bunch of stakes out in there or, or put occasional plants that actually grow up, maybe some wildflowers that will go up, providing vertical structure so um, uh, spiders can make their webs. I, I readily admit, ma'am, that that is not the best answer, but that is a, that's a hard one. So I appreciate you asking the hard question first. Now everything else is going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. She was. Sir, sure, well, I've never done any research in a tilled field. We just don't have them in Pennsylvania in a larger number for me to make uh, a difference. Yes. Wow. Okay. Okay, so um, nice lady up front here has a bunch of questions. For those in the back who couldn't hear, um, she's been doing no-till and cover cropping for a while now, but has tended to buy treated seed. So um, the first thing she's interested in is, uh, I'm going to go with the second one first, how to get un a good untreated seed for north central Iowa, correct? Um, my experience has been is that the local seed companies have the best options for untreated seed. I've had conversations with the large seed companies. Um, you can name them as easily as I can. I've been told point blank by some of them, we are a treated seed company. That's the direction we go, uh, that's the direction we're going, and if you want untreated seed, you need to go somebody else. In central Pennsylvania, we have um, 
a good number of local companies that are responding to the need that people are having to have untreated seeds. The large seed companies will say, we don't have any demand for untreated seed, but that's a difficult argument to buy when your whole catalog is treated, right? So I just don't buy it. Uh, the farmers I interact with in Pennsylvania, particularly those in the no-till alliance, want untreated seed, and they're going to their local seed provider um, that probably don't, aren't as active out here, but one of the best is called local seeds. They used to be called TA seeds. They're local seeds. I can give you a list of Pennsylvania seeds, but that's not very helpful for you. Oh, yeah, you can always go with an organic variety, um, and my experience has been in, so Pennsylvania, uh, Penn State has a uh, Penn State variety trial. Every year we see um, the, the grain crop specialist plants various corn varieties to see which ones perform best against the, kind of the ones that are out there, and they're all submitted by companies. So some companies don't submit, like Pioneer just doesn't submit. Um, but of the companies that do submit, there's typically an untreated, untraded conventional near the top of the pile. And that should be bought by everybody as far as I'm concerned because it's less cost, right? Uh, the, the first question she asked was, um, how do I know if I have slugs? How can I trap for them? And what's an economic threshold? Um, so we use, a, uh, we use a white shingle. So we go to Lowe's, we buy um, uh, a rolled roofing that is white and we cut it up into one foot by one foot sections. We use a reciprocating saw and a utility knife to cut it. Um, we put those in the field and we check them weekly. Uh, we try to check them before 9 a.m. because we don't want them to heat up. The reason that they're white is they'll heat up more slowly, um, but we still, they'll, they'll still heat up. So we want to catch them early in the morning. So we're typically out there at 7.30, something like that, starting to check our shingles. And all, we found that between one and two slugs per shingle per week um, is when you start to see a problem on your adjacent corn or soybean. So the economic threshold that we go with is about one and a half slugs per shingle. Does that answer your question, ma'am? Yeah, right. So if you have that in one week, but it's not there the next week, it's not as concerning. So it's kind of averaged over the course of the spring. So we need to do this um, before planting and then after planting. And that provides a little bit of a pain in the neck because you typically got to take the shingles out so they're not ruined. Um, so it's a little bit more high intensity. You can just put them out after planting and just see what's there, um, and one and a half, so 1.5 slugs per trap per week is what we go for. Right, so the, so the question is, if, if we're above that threshold, then what do you do? Um, so the only commercial, commercially available slug control option are baits, um, and they are typically metaldehyde-based baits. Uh, metaldehyde is an active ingredient, um, and their product's called Deadline, but metaldehyde is spelled M-E-T-A-L-D-E-H-Y-D-E. Aldehyde. Is that spelled right? Yes, that's spelled right. Metaldehyde. Uh, the, the commercial, uh, the trade name is typically Deadline. There's also um, Deadline pellets, Deadline mini pellets, Deadline bullets. You can get them from your um, chemical supplier. The problem with them is they typically be, are 20 to $25 an acre. Um, and you buy them in a 50-pound bag, my advice is, is to have some on hand. If you know you have slug problems, buy a bag or two, and then just meter it out slowly. The best way to spread this stuff is on the back of a four-wheeler with a spinner spreader. But what I found is farmers that, um, that need it, they can just treat like the corner of a field. So typically slugs aren't throughout a 40-acre field. They're just like in a corner or just in the center or something like that. And you can just spread it locally. And the goal when you spread that stuff is to get four to six pellets per square foot. This is far too much information, but she asked the question. Is that satisfying, ma'am? Very satisfying. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. So, um, uh, we actually just did some research the past couple of years. Oh, the question is what the fertilizers do to pest populations and then natural enemy populations. So we found that, um, yes, manure makes slug populations worse. Um, so if you're regularly treating with manure, you could tend to have higher slug populations simply because of the moisture. There's more organic matter. But we've also found that the, um, because of that organic matter input, you have a stronger food web there and you actually have more predators. So if you can, that manure will help foster a stronger predator population. Uh, and we typically compare that to uh, what would be a conventional 
um, inorganic uh, fertilizer applications. So that's not always anhydrous in our neck of the woods, but that would be the best comparison I can give you. So our expectation would be that because of the organic matter of the, f of the manure, that's driving a stronger organic-based food web that's going to make more predators, but it can make slug populations worse. So you just have to balance the two, and IPM is particularly uh, important in manured systems. You're welcome. Yes? Uh, the question is, where do I suggest you go to get more information on IPM? You can call me whenever you want. Uh, <laughs> uh, you might not do that. But uh, um, yeah, there are, there are entire uh, college courses on IPM. I mean, there's a, uh, there's a course at, um, what's this university called? Iowa State University. Um, <laughs> Um, that is, uh, it used to be taught by Larry Pedigo. I can't remember who the current professor is that teaches that. Does O'Neill teach that? Um, but, I mean, there, so there are textbooks. Uh, there are websites. There's a website put out by the University of Minnesota called, I, it's just like the IPM online textbook where you can get more information. So uh, there's plenty of information, but I would go to a .edu to get the trustworthy information. That's back there. Right, yeah, so you know what you're talking about. Yes, there, there have been um, these genomic type studies that have uh, been done where they have a treated, oh, the question was, what do the neonics do to plant gene expression and can that help make pet, uh, plants more attractive? Yes, so um, that, that is the case. There are some research papers that have shown that the gene expression of plants grown from a uh, treated seed are different. Um, and one of the problems is, is that um, uh, for one of the insecticides that's coated on seeds, one of the first metabolites is very similar to a plant-based compound called salicylic acid, which is a mediator of plant defenses. And there's evidence that when you have some of these insecticide-coated seeds, they actually have worse defenses, kind of endogenous defenses against pests. So the answer is kind of yes. Um, so if, uh, but, and, and that, uh, I should say that the most evidence for that has come from a cotton, from cotton plants and soybean plants. But we see more and more um, uh, spider mites in Pennsylvania, both on soy and in uh, corn. And I can't help but thinking that part of the spider mite problem is because of the neonic seed treatment, which is what they've shown in that cotton study down at Texas A&M University is where it came from. Is that satisfying? <laughs> You've been very patient. Thank you. That's the first question. Okay, so my first question is, are there specific cover crops that harbor better beneficial arthropod populations than others? Uh, the answer has to be yes. Um, what they are, I don't have the perfect answer for you. Uh, we've done most of our cover crop work with cereal rye because most growers are open to cereal rye. Um, more farmers, oh, sorry, more researchers are looking at cover crop mixtures what some people call cover crop cocktail simply because of the alliteration. I personally don't care for that expression. Let's call it a mixture. Um, and, and there's this relationship in the world between plant species diversity and arthropod species diversity. So as plant species diversity goes up, arthropod diversity goes up also. So in my mind, that means if you're using mixtures, you can expect to have, you can expect to have stronger predator populations early in the season. But the key here is that 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 cover crop needs to be around when insects are active. So if you're terminating your cover crop in April, and the average temperature in April hasn't gotten above 50 degrees, you're not going to have much insect activity there. So that's another benefit of this planting green, is that they're letting their cover crops get really big, and they're terminating them in May, sometimes late May. That's, again, Pennsylvania. And one of the benefits of that is it can act as better habitat, because, you, as you all know, insects are cold-blooded. They're only as active as the atmosphere allows them to be. So hoping that a cover crop will provide good habitat for a large suite of natural enemies in April is a bit unrealistic. You have more than one question? Uh huh.
Uh huh. Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, so these are small scale uh, vegetable growers and they want to know how the uh, landscape, no, they want to, right. So landscape can influence the composition of the insects in your field in your area. Um, I would bet that you don't have hills near your farm, mountains. No, right. So you're not going to change the landscape, you're not going to change the landscape, right? But what you're asking what you can do. Um, and I would go back to the same relationship that I answered on your first question, is that relationship between plant species diversity and arthropod species diversity. So anything you can do to increase the plant species diversity on your farm, both in your crop fields and outside your crop field, is going to help. Um, there was a study that came out of uh, a European group in, in 2015 that showed that no, so, yeah, so just to make sure everyone's on the same page, research kind of uh, landscape ecology level research has shown that where you have a more diverse landscape, you have more beneficial arthropods in crop fields, okay? But you can't erect mountains in Iowa very easily, so what are the alternatives? Turns out that that paper showed one of the alternatives is no-till. So having a no-till field actually can compensate for the benefits of a more diverse landscape. I understand that no-till vegetable production is challenging, to say the least, uh, but working towards that, finding some intermediate, is, uh, is a great direction to try to go. Um, I interact in Pennsylvania occasionally with a gentleman who seems to have no-till vegetable production kind of in hand. Um, he is a very progressive Mennonite farmer. I can put you uh, after, if I remember his name in the next 10 minutes, I'll try to Golly, he's, a, he's kind of a famous dude. Um, no, it's not Steve Groff, but thank you for knowing a Pennsylvania no-tiller. Good for you. John not John Kemp. Uh, he's in, he was in Connecticut. Oh, okay, he's some, um, not Dave Brandt. Um, it's gonna come to me as I fall asleep tonight, but I can get you that gentleman's name, and he'll, he'll answer the phone, he's really great. Right, 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 right. So this guy, he uh, has, um, he heavily uses cover crops. He's got a, a really diverse rotation, and he lets fields sit without productivity, uh, without crop production for um, years on a time to generate kind of soil benefits he's looking for. I'll, it'll come to me. Please. Yes, um, so the question has to do with uh, worldwide insect declines, and the gentleman just asked me to comment on that. Um, it seems to be real, uh, and the most concerning data that I've seen, which hasn't gotten widespread attention, so the, the widespread attention recently came from a study that came out of Germany. A bunch of um, amateur uh, uh, entomologists have been tracking uh, kind of insect abundance for like 30 years in nature reserves in Germany, and they found that pest, uh, insect, uh, insect biomass has decreased 75% over the last 30 years. That was the first study that got a lot of attention in 2017. And then in 2018, a similar study came out of the mountain rainforest in Puerto Rico that showed a very similar number, about a 75% uh, decline over the last 30 years. The data that aren't getting any attention are coming from the Arctic, and of course the Arctic is warming three times faster than the rest of the globe. And the insect, sorry, the arthropod declines in the Arctic are just as concerning, if not more so. So they've seen equivalent declines in fly and spider populations at Arctic field stations in Greenland, where pesticide use is not a problem, right? So because of those data, you can contribute to that response mostly to global climate change. But other responses in the United States are confounded by pesticide use, urbanization, suburban sprawl, all this stuff um, in addition to climate change. And we know that large um, uh, predator populations are down across the, the globe. We know that giraffe populations are going down. We know that bird populations are going down. And the, the decline that's gotten the most um, attention has been bee decline. But th these, these studies that have come out more recently are showing that bee decline is more likely just a, uh, under the umbrella of a larger insect decline. So bees are just another taxon that is going down along with a lot of other things. 
It's sad, but it seems to be real. Yes? Oh. Oh. I'll be hanging out down here if you want more. Thank you very much.